काय त्यांचे उरलेले आहेत ते त्यांना देणार बट सम थर्टी लिव्ह सो यू विल बट दे हॅव टेकन ड्युरिंग दे डोंट हॅव दॅट मनी टेन फिफ्टीन आय थिंक दे हॅव वॉट एव्हर इज ड्यू विल गिव्ह दॅम वी हॅव ऑलवेज गिव्ह बट नाव दे लाईट पोस्टिंग ओके शुअर चला ऑल द बेस्ट morning good evening good afternoon to each and every delegates in any part of the world who have joined us in this fifth aura webinar fifth lecture in the aura webinar series 2021 in association with uh, fuse film sonosite and anesthesia tv today we have got two great speakers dr amit dikshit and dr harsal wag who will be amit will be speaking on ultrasound guided neuroaxial ns blocks and uh, dr harsal will be speaking on practical tips and tricks on ultrasound guided sciatic nerve block so to start the academic event let me introduce dr amit dikshit who will be speaking on ultrasound guided neuroaxial blocks <laughs> Dr. Amit Dikshit is a consultant, anesthesia, and acute pain specialist at Ruby Hall Clinic, Pune. He is a course lead in regional anesthesia, MUHS fellowship program, and Aura fellowship program. He is a member of Board of Studies of Academy of Regional Anesthesia of India. He is a peer reviewer of Indian Journal of Anesthesia and a member of PQ Foundation. the major achievements of dr amit dikshit he is a course director for a structured regional anesthesia workshop under piku foundation in association with usabcd.org he is a course coordinator for several workshop on basic and advanced eco cardiography he has contributed many chapters in regional anesthesia and focus handbook by springer publication He has contributed videos in Focus Today app, which is an initiative by National University Hospitals Singapore, and he has many articles which are published in Index Journal. So he is a man who has mastered regional anesthesia and also has become a master of Focus. So over to you, Dr. Amit Dikshit. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... ritesh for all those kind words uh, i am really delighted back for this lecture ultrasound guided uh, spine and spine sono anatomy is very close to my heart uh, so today i'll be discussing for next 20 minutes on uh, this topic which includes basic as well as advanced 
techniques. So <clears throat> greetings to you all from Ruby Hall Clinic. And it's a 750 bedded multi-speciality hospital. We have uh, AORA and MUHS Regional Anesthesia Fellowship. And uh, we do have good dedicated ultrasound machines in uh, all our OT complexes. So this has created a favorable environment for uh, you know regional anesthesia and spine sonar anatomy. And from last uh, almost four to five years, I have been doing spine sonar anatomy for almost all my cases. And uh, so I'll be sharing some of the interesting findings. So my lecture outline will be on basics of spine sonar anatomy, some of the literature review. I'll be talking on ultrasound assisted and ultrasound guided. We have completed recently one research, research project uh, in this regard. I'll be sharing some of the findings with that aspect as well. So why ultrasound spinal and epidural? Why people are moving towards spinal and epidural with ultrasound? Because probably everyone wants high success rate. They want uh, uh, you know single pass needle puncture, less needle redirection. In our institute, uh, obstetricians are saying, please give that single shot spinal with ultrasound. Our patients are very happy with that. Even patients are demanding when we say that we'll do it in one prick. And lesser complication rate, we do not wish to see neurological compli com complications. Congruous epidural placement is possible with use of ultrasound and therefore good pain management. So there are multiple advantages. So we'll just see, you know, few landmark articles. Uh, this was from 2013 RAPN. And it has discussed about utility uh, in orthopedic population for spinal anesthesia. And the salient features where they have done a parasagittal oblique scan and a transverse midline scan. And uh, what they have found, the, the, the assessment of efficacy was number of skin punctures required. And this is how we rate our success rate with spinal or epidural. So number of skin punctures attempts so in first attempt so as of now there are no established uh, you know definitions or criteria for difficult neuroaxial block but i am sure uh, a few of my friends are even doing good research in this area to develop a scoring system which will soon be uh, uh, you know available to all of us and it takes into account various aspects like presence of osteophyte intervertebral narrowing how much is the distance previous history of difficult spinal so on and so forth the important conclusion from this study was when posterior complex and anterior complex, uh, so they looked at anterior complex and the posterior complex, and when both are seen, then the dural puncture is uh, is very easy. I mean, when you see anterior complex and posterior complex, it, it becomes easy. And when it cannot be seen clearly, when you cannot see posterior complex or anterior complex clearly, then in the same article, it has mentioned that you should keep low threshold for abandoning the procedure. And this has uh, this is really true in my practice. I just do a pre-procedural scan. And if I do not see, uh, you know, uh, either anterior complex or posterior complex, then uh, I just try one or two, two attempts maybe. And I immediately convert it to general anesthesia. Patients are much happy. Uh, everyone is aware. So we can be really precise and accurate with what we are what we are doing. Now the another landmark article was this systematic review and meta-analysis. And uh, it, 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 it has shown, this was from April 2016, that use of ultrasound increases the accuracy of identification of lumbar interspace. It is accurate in estimation of depth, so you can choose your needle and equipment. It has improved efficacy, I mean the skin puncture. Uh, it improves safety, so overall complication rate and uh, other things. So uh, congruous epidural placement and so we'll just come to some basic uh, you know scanning techniques so there are predominantly two techniques one is a transverse midline scan and second is a parasagittal scan so we we do you know paramedian sagittal oblique and all that so uh, you know i have been teaching this uh, spine sonar anatomy so what the common uh, issue with this is transverse midline scan is very easy for most of the candidates but when it comes to parasagittal oblique and things like that most of the delegates most of the trainees do struggle they are in they are not able to identify the interlaminar area correctly and i think this is one of the reason because of the inability to do a parasagittal scan properly people think that uh, this is not my cup of tea 
and spine sono anatomy is very difficult so i am just here to share first thing is a transverse midline scan and this i think is very easy everyone can do it even my pgs are doing it and what we see here is some pattern recognition so we what we identify the pattern is we see transverse process we see lamina and in some obese patients sometimes these are the only two surrogate markers then we see posterior complex and anterior complex posterior complex is made up of ligamentum flavum and posterior dura and the anterior complex is made up of anterior dura and posterior longitudinal ligament we may or may not see epidural space we sometimes we we most of the time we see only these two white lines so if we are seeing both these two lines and ultrasound beam is traveling in straight line and it is hitting the dura why not my needle if i follow the same path so this is the principle so ultrasound beam can come straight and hit dura i just have to mimic the same path so now coming to parasagittal scan parasagittal scan is little tricky we have practiced and mastered it by use of you know phantom models and uh, looking at the transverse process then the articular processes then the lamina and making it you know parasagittal and then oblique and all that it's it's tricky but i am sure if somebody is really keen on having this skill set they will definitely have it so what we even uh, finally the end point for this scan is uh, we see interlaminar space uh, we can see it as a horse head and neck sign or a factory roof or there are multiple names we will not go into that but what we see here is posterior complex and anterior complex and if we could see this we can bring the whole structure in the middle of the screen and we can use an m mode button as a marker and we can mark it so i am just showing how we do it so first first and the foremost step for ultrasound assisted spinal or epidural is we need to know the intervertebral level so i am i am seeing the first strip here this is a subclavian perivascular area which is very common to you all and uh, we just we just take it behind we look at the transverse processes 1 2 3 4 we go on counting down uh, downwards and we see and we can exactly note the level the other way of doing it is we can uh, calculate we can see the ribs in the lower area and we can see where is t12 and so so that is how we can identify the intervertebral level in lumbar area we know how we move from cordocranial direction from sacrum upwards so this is the first step and uh, actually we want to reach to an intervertebral yeah the interspinous process area so this is a transverse midline scan and it is very easy so once we reach this area we identify the structure so how i do it so first a very simple technique which which we are commoning which we are commonly using and this is ultrasound assisted spinal so what we do is we do just a transverse midline scan and uh, with the transverse midline scan once the scanning is done we see the posterior complex and the anterior complex we bring the whole structure in the middle of the screen and so that uh, you know we can see the posterior complex and the anterior complex in the middle we then mark the midpoint of the probe the midpoint of the length and midpoint of the breadth of the probe and the intersection of these two point is the my point of entry so i am now aware that this is my point of entry i am just marking it with the cap of the needle and then we do it with a conventional way what we have found is if uh, somebody is taking uh, 10 attempts for doing spinal then with ultrasound it is reduced to two and for practical purpose i i am i am i'll show you my study as well we are getting it in single puncture and if uh, both uh, the posterior and anterior complexes are seen all right so this is how we do the marking part uh, we keep it simple and there are other aspects to it where we can see exactly the angle with the use of a clinometer bubble app which is available with android phones and you can have it so why are we making it so complicated so this is the common question which my uh, colleagues which my pgs are asking why are we making it so complicated now there are some some studies which which can support my argument and uh, the, you can see ligamentum flavum is absent in some individuals and uh, this was one study uh, where a patient developed post dural puncture Uh, you know the dural puncture was made uh, an un unintentional dural puncture was uh, there with uh, labor analgesia and later they just looked at the 
the anatomy and they found that ligamentum flammum was absent so you can see on the right side how the black hypoechoic area and you do not you are not able to see this white line of posterior complex so uh, the conclusion is if we do a pre procedural scan and if we see that their ligamentum flammum is absent then we are aware that these are the patients we who, who which are very high risk for you know uh, unintentional dural puncture so we have devised one study and the question is uh, why why people are keeping this uh, use of spine ultrasound only for complicated cases like obesity scoliosis instrumented spine so we thought is transverse midline scan which is very simple to perform can we can, can uh, is it equally efficacious uh versus a conventional technique and the conventional technique is where people have combined transverse midline scan and parasagittal oblique scan so here uh, 25 patients were allotted in both the groups in one uh, group only the transverse midline scan was done and in other we have actually marked the level we have put a caliper and we have calculated how, at what depth and we have even used a clinometer bubble app to know the angle so a very systematic uh, you know uh, uh, scanning was done in the uh, uh, group so first group was named uh, named as limited view and the second group was extended view and our primary objective was assessment of efficacy and uh, as per previous uh, literature review the number of skin puncture was uh, was was the end point to assess the efficacy the secondary objectives were traumatic type number of needle redirection hitting the bone periosteum total time required conversion to general anesthesia inclusion criteria we have included asa 1 and 2 patients from 18 to 65 and they were non pregnant patients and bmi uh, 35 or less so what we have found is a single shot spinal and that is when we are talking about the the number of punctures so they were done in single puncture in both the groups so the primary objective was you know what we have found is that both the techniques are equally efficacious so if we if we do only limited view because finally we do not want that whole bunch of scanning if it is not going to change my outcome so we thought of this limited view which is very easily possible by all my pgs and so that we can use this technique for all our patients so we found that it is equally efficacious so there were some interesting findings so the scanning time was uh, the mean scanning time in limited view that is the transverse midline was 43 seconds and with extended view where we have combined and uh, we have done a detailed scanning was 204 seconds now to our surprise we found that the procedural time the procedural time was like from insertion of needle to getting of clear csf it was also found uh, less in limited view and it was statistically significant what the cause probably was because in the extended view we have given all the information to the performer that you have to go 10 degree as per the clinometer bubble app and you will get the spinal at 3.4 cm so this has caused some amount of restriction in the movement and it took probably more time so this was an another interesting finding which we have not expected uh needle redirections were comparable in both the groups so we cannot say that you know if we do a detailed and more uh, scan uh, uh, analysis of the spinal area it will have improved outcome so this was another supportive study where you can find that in an in even an inexperienced resident who has done less than 5 epidural if we could mark the point and tell them to perform the it has been found that the success rate is more needle redirections are less so what is the importance of parasagittal oblique scan it is a difficult level 3 skill set and if we want but it has its own advantages so exact correct intervertebral level is important when it comes to epidural because congruous epidural placement inspection of interlaminar area for presence of osteophyte and and sometimes when uh, transverse midline scan is just inconclusive and when it comes to upper thoracic epidural and all that it is invariably parasagittal oblique so coming to little bit about thoracic epidural this was first uh, you know thoracic epidural studies were correlated with mri and they found that ultrasound has a role and then there were multiple studies which showed that ultrasound assisted thoracic is uh, is a useful technique 
and they have looked at the number of needle uh, skin punctures redir redirection they have compared with landmark technique and you can see more than three attempts um, there were uh, like 12 patients so everyone will agree that in some patients if uh, you know it is difficult it continues to be difficult and we don't know how much time we have spent so that sort of a embarrassing situation can be very well avoided uh, with use of pre procedural scan so they have compared the data and they found that uh, it is uh, ultrasound technique is better and it was statistically good even the post surgical pain because we could exactly note where the epidural is been placed so i'm not going into greater details but uh, this this type of uh, you know 3d anatomy nowadays is available everywhere uh you can download it uh, on uh, different apps and uh, color uh, 3d atlas is available and you can use this to note exact anatomy of upper thoracic middle thoracic and lower thoracic areas so gadgets are useful now when it comes to upper and middle thoracic median approach uh, para sagittal technique how we do it is uh, we just note uh, exact level now when it comes to lower thoracic it is similar to that of uh, you know lumbar area but going to higher uh, level of uh, thoracic you can you can see the posterior complex and the lamina here is flat so you can actually drop a caliper from the uh, posterior complex and note how much is the exact depth so it is coming to around 3.13 and then the marking can be done in the similar way with a criss cross method the midpoint of the breadth and the midpoint of the length and intersection of that point will be the point of entry you can mark it or with a cap of a needle and you can proceed uh, success rate increases dramatically sometimes the posterior complex can be confused as the overlap overlapping lamina and what we have found is when we tend to see the anterior complex as well as the posterior complex success rate is much higher so uh, it is good idea to see try uh, to try to look at the anterior complex as well uh real time our experience recently we have started doing real time scan and real time scan uh, you know good experience you can advance it uh, with the help of simulation this was with dr vaibhavi who helped us in getting the simulation for uh, ultrasound assisted ultrasound guided spinal here you can try all needling techniques now the problem with real time assisted uh, this was by amitab gulati and they have discussed in length how the probe should be placed and uh, how it should be tilted uh, you know uh, the landing zone uh, increases but all these uh, these techniques have have discussed in plane technique and in plane technique uh, what we have uh, at least in uh, in our center we have really struggled with this in plane technique even this was uh, the recent article from rapm 2 2021 and uh, they are looking at the placement of catheter uh, in thoracic epidural again uh, it was an in plane technique and uh, so our journey with real time ultrasound also started with in plane technique and what we have found is even in a lateral decubitus position when we place a curvilinear probe uh, and we do in plane it it may not be exactly at the 90 90 degree angle most of the time that uh, that uh, ultrasound is either uh, little it has got a caudal tilt or cephalic tilt most of the time cephalic tilt of 10 degree and therefore in plane needling becomes challenging so what we have uh, changed our technique is we have started doing out of plane technique with a better success rate so i'll be just showing you uh, how we do it so first and the foremost is we mark the intervertebral level and that we can easily do from sacrum upwards and we can know so if it is a hip surgery probably l1 l2 so on and so forth i can know the exact level and uh, with uh, with so the transverse midline scan i can i can first give the local i can see the posterior complex and you can see the movement of needle there so you can easily guide your needle uh towards the midline towards the posterior complex you know exactly at what depth it has to go so sometimes i tend to use the hybrid technique so if you pass the uh, you know epidural or spinal needle close to the probe curvilinear probe you know and uh, more or less parallel you tend to see the shaft of needle and also the tip so uh, this is uh, this is a combination approach so once we go uh, really at the desired area 
then uh, I do loss of resistance to saline and try to take less amount of saline because then uh, the needling becomes challenging. So you can see now the loss of resistance has happened and we have been able to achieve. So you can easily place a catheter down there. Uh, special needles are special syringes are available like Episure with uh, you know wire reinforced and spring action. Now, uh, when it comes to parasagittal oblique scan, that also uh, we do out of plane. Now I'm showing here the spinal uh, and this practice will help you to develop confidence in doing thoracic epidural, which is again uh, parasagittal uh, and with out of plane technique. So local is being administered and we tend to pass the needle. So we bring the structure in the middle of the skin. We see the posterior complex and you can see some movement of uh, needle coming down in the posterior complex area. So you can see, uh, uh, so uh, this, this was a 25 gauge VitaCare needle. And uh, uh, once uh, the, you tend to see some amount of introducer and then the spinal and you can see the CSF is coming up. Now, th this was a uh, courtesy by Amjit who, who shared with me the echogenic spinal needles are nowadays available with Pyank and you can have it uh, if you are interested. There are just one or two case re cases which we have done. This was a intrathecal, uh, you know, placement of catheter for a 29 weeks child, 100 and, uh, one, one, uh, 1100 gram. So just around one kg and we have placed this on request of uh, our pediatrician. This patient has a brain infection and uh, the catheter was placed almost for 21 days and uh, every day uh, antibiotic was administered. Every third day, the CSF culture was done. We were not sure whether the this was during the COVID times and uh, uh, the catheter, what we have used is a 29 gauge pictel because uh, because of lockdown, whatever was available. We did a transverse midline scan and out of plane technique for placing this. And this was, these are, uh, his name is Shahad and he has conveyed his greeting along with his mother. Now he's one and a half year old. So uh, another thing is I'm not going into pediatric uh, more of that, but this was a patient uh, in 2015 long time video was good. So I thought uh, it is relevant today. Uh, epidural catheters can be very nicely seen. You can use, uh, you know, uh, the PNS and SUI test we all know. So uh, spine anatomy is wonderfully seen when it comes to pediatrics. So one small tip and trick because everyone is saying why you are getting higher success rate and why not we. So prayer to almighty is my one word and I looked at the literature evidence for this. So it has been it has been found that uh, 212 published studies are there and they found that 75% were reported to have positive effect. So if you are praying with your patient before surgery, it improves your concentration and improves success rate, which is very much necessary for a regional anesthetist. So how do I look upon this journey? Some of my thoughts. So. My journey, what I'm seeing is there is good amount of literature, uh, what I would say, uh, terrific literature on ultrasound spine. It is just like some comparable with echocardiography. And what we need now is probably a point of care approach. So we need not to go in greater details of everything. We just need one simple question and simple answer. So we have to develop this focus approach. So where is the skin puncture set? Where should I put my needle? Where, sh what should be my direction? This is the simple question. You please answer it. I don't want what is the facet thing and uh, other details and details of sono anatomy. So here, say, for example, my focus question is, are we requiring long spinal needle? Yes or no. So I would like to do a focus interrogation, which is for these answers. So I am looking at the posterior complex, I'm dropping a caliper and I am getting the answer. It is less than eight centimeter, probably you may not require. So KISS principle, this reminds me of, keep it simple and safe. So this concludes my topic. So we, ultrasound is a uh, way forward. It reduces needle passes. Depth and intervertebral level can be accurately identified. Nowadays, we are moving towards program intermittent bolus. This is not uh, the topic which I'm planning to cover, but focus approach uh, is definitely useful. Thank you very much for patient listening. I'm grateful to my contribution from the department. Thank you.
Thank you, Amit, uh, for a nice, compact uh, talk on the ultrasound guided neuroaxial blocks. Uh, we will uh, take the question and answers after uh, the second talk. Over to you, Amjad. Thank you, Ritesh. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Harshal Vag is a consultant anesthesiologist at the prestigious Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital in Mumbai. He has over 16 years of experience in anesthesia. He completed his primary anesthetic training from KM Hospital Mumbai and furthered his qualifications with an FRCA from London. Now, Dr. Harshal, we all know, is a self-confessed workaholic. Uh, personally, I have never seen him in any other garment apart from his scrubs, and you can see him wearing that right now. Uh, he, has, he is a dedicated and committed anesthesiologist with keen interest in robotic procedures and liver transplant. But thankfully for us, he didn't get distracted by that and continues to be an avid practitioner of regional anesthesia. He is a loved member of the executive committee of AORA and also the fellowship supervisor for regional anesthesia at his institute. He has several publications to his name and is, uh, is and has been a sought after faculty. What is truly delightful when you read uh, about Herschel is that uh, something very delightful for our specialty. Uh, Dr. Harshal was named among the top doctors in Mumbai in 2019 by the India Today magazine. And once again in 2020 uh, by the Outlook magazine. Harshal, we are very proud of you for this. Today, he will be reminding us about the importance of the sciatic nerve block, as well as give us some tips on how to achieve a better block. Over to you, Harshal. Dr. Amjad, thank you very much. That was embarrassing, actually, but thank you very much. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Is that uh, visible and am I audible now? Yeah, you are visible. Your slides are visible. You are audible. Thank you. Uh, so, um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ritesh and Dr. Amjad, and special thanks to him, Dr. Amjad as well, Dr. Sandeep Diwan, Dr. Ritesh, and Dr. Siva for the for the inputs for this talk, and uh, and Amit always because Amit Amit has always been a teacher. So, my topic is uh, tips and tricks for a successful ultrasound guided sciatic nerve block. We'll come to tips and tricks a little bit later, but the fact always remains that the eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know. For the mind to know, you have to know the anatomy and the surface anatomy. And the eyes and the mind have to get used to that sono anatomy. So you get used to the sono anatomy picture. Once that is done, then performing the block actually is just one part of the entire process. So just going to go through. I've got a lot more slides than Amitai. So I'm just going to go through them and see how much we get through. So we all know that the sciatic nerve is part of the lumbosacral plexus coming from L4, L5, S1, S2, S3 spinal nerve. Uh, it exits the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen uh, behind the pyriformis muscle, goes into the gluteal region, and then enters the back of the thigh line between the ischial tuberosity and the uh, uh, greater trochanter. Now, if you look at this picture, and I want to keep uh, this picture, all of you to keep this picture in mind, where you know the so that the muscles and the bony structures, as we scan the area around this. Uh, we get an idea of what the uh, sono anatomy is going to be. So the, 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 the important structures bit is the gluteus maximus, which covers most of the area of interest of us. That is the gluteus medius there, the pyriformis muscle behind which the sciatic nerve exits through the greater sciatic foramen. It lies between the shill tuberosity and the uh, greater trochanter as it exits and goes into the back of the thigh and the quadratus femoris muscle. So these are a few muscles and bony structures that we need to be uh, aware of while doing the scan in this area. So a similar anatomy picture is here as well with the greater sciatic foramen, the pyriformis muscle behind which the greater sciatic, uh, the sciatic nerve exits through the greater sciatic uh, foramen. The other two important uh, bony landmarks are the greater trochanter and the ischial tuberosity. 
and there is a reason for i keep saying that because these are these uh, sonar anatomy landmarks that uh, one needs to be aware of in case because while scanning the sciatic nerve in this area sometimes we find difficult to identify the sciatic nerve the other important point to remember while scanning uh, the uh, the sciatic nerve in this area as well is the sciatic nerve though in between these two bony landmarks it tends to be a little bit on the side of the ischial tuberosity that is another tip to find out where the location of the sciatic nerve is going to be the other important uh, nerve especially when we are trying to do any surgeries in the supply of the sciatic nerve is also the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh and there seems to be a thinking that it is probably not contained in the same sheath as the sciatic nerve and it is separately and may need to be blocked differently in, in case you need to have any surgeries on the area that it supplies which is basically the uh, the back of the thigh and and sometimes even reaches up to the popliteal uh, fossa so again that is just a cadaveric picture of how the sciatic nerve exits behind the piriformis muscle and again to show that it lies tending a little bit towards the uh, ischial tuberosity as compared to the greater trochanter. Now, anatomy wise, again, we need to know what is the dermatomal, osteotomal, and myotomal nerve supply of the area that you're going to be operating on. And um, that goes a great deal in identifying and deciding what level of the sciatic nerve block or the parasacral nerve block that you're going to do in order to involve whatever area you're going to achieve. So, as a general rule, for the parasacral approach to the sacral plexus, the transgluteal uh, approach or the subgluteal sciatic nerve block and the anterior approach, you would want to use a, a low frequency curvilinear probe. Uh, depending on the size of the patient, if, uh, if, the, if you can probably get away by using a linear probe infragluteally and below, up, below uh, down to the popliteal area. So you can get away with that. Now, for a parasacral approach or a, a subgluteal sciatic nerve block. This is probably the most uh, preferred position where the patient is on the one side, the side to be blocked is up, knee flexed, and um, the scanning can be done from uh, facing the patient, the patient is facing you. Now, starting from the subgluteal approach. So I think all of us have gone through the, the learning curve where nerve visualization in this area is difficult. That is why the bony landmarks, which is the ischial tuberosity and the greater trochanter help us with the localization of the needle. The identification of the subgluteal space also helps. And I'm going to come to that subgluteal space a little bit later. And usually these approaches is good for hip procedures below the hip. And you have to be aware of that posterior cutaneous femoral nerve supply may not be in, uh, blocked reliably in this approach. So this is just one publication, of, but this is a cadaveric study where they say that you, need, you might need a, a different uh, uh, block for that. And in fact, they have found it to be a superficial and lateral to the uh, sciatic nerve at the level of the infragluteal region. Now coming to actually the, uh, the uh, subgluteal uh, sciatic nerve block. Now again, this publication came out in uh, 2007 by Dr. Karmaka's group, where they, they say that the, the probe position is going to be looking in such a way that you want to get the greater trochanter and the ischial tuberosity in your view. So if I keep the probe in that orientation, one would assume to find, so from the skin, you would want to see the, the gluteus maximus muscle, which probably covers the entire uh, area where the uh, ultrasound probe is kept. Below that is going to be your sciatic nerve. The two bony landmarks are going to be the greater trochanter, the ischial tuberosity, then you get to see the sciatic nerve that is sandwiched between the uh, gluteus maximus muscle and the quadratus femoris, which is lying below it. Now, this is actually my, my scan, and this is my right hip where I can see the, the ischial tuberosity, the greater trochanter, and the sciatic nerve that is sandwiched between the gluteus maximus muscle and the quadratus femoris. Now, I would also want you to look at these two wide hyperechoic lines, which are sort of go around the sciatic nerve. And those are, this is the epimyceum of both the muscles. And the reason I'm saying that again, I'll come to it later when we talk about that subgluteal space. So there's a potential space that one can see between these two hyperechoic lines and the epimyceum of both the muscles, which is the subgluteal space. So that's the sciatic nerve area. And if I were to do an in-plane needling of for a, a subgluteal sciatic nerve block, then my needle trajectory would probably come like that and inject local anesthetic in that area. 
Now coming to the other approach for the sciatic nerve block is the parasacral approach. And this, if you remember the anatomy picture before, where uh, the nerve exits the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen. Uh, so you probably catch most of the nerves of the sciatic plexus or sacral plexus. And these are for the surgeries of the pelvic surgeries, for hip surgeries, and obviously any surgeries below. But you have to be aware of injury to the rectum and the gluteal vessels. So always a good idea to use Doppler in that area when you're doing these uh, parasacral approach. Now there, I'm going to talk about uh, the parasacral approaches by two methods. This is the what is called as a parasacral parallel shift, which is uh, popularized by Benston et al. Now what they talk about is forming a line from the greater trochanter to the posterior uh, superior iliac spine. Midpoint of that line, you keep the ultrasound probe medial to the midpoint of that line and move the probe from superolateral position to an inferomedial position so as to identify the structures along the way. And I'll, I'll come to that uh, in a minute. But this is just the surface anatomy and how the probe is is moved. Now, if I have to do an in-plane leading, that would be in my direction of the needle from a lateral to medial side. So the same, if I were to keep the probe, well, this is the, uh, the line joining the greater trochanter to the posterior superior iliac spine. Mid medial to the midpoint is what my probe uh, position would be there. Now, if you imagine the anatomy slide previously as well, so you would, what one would see the majority of the mus mus muscle is the uh, gluteus maximus below that in this area would be the gluteus medius as well. And then you would see a, a bony structure, which is the L of the ilium, which is going to be seen uh, below that. As I move the probe in an inferomedial position, one would expect to find what everybody talks about is the break in the continuity of that bone, which represents the greater sciatic notch. And then one would see below the uh, gluteus maximus would be the piriformis muscle behind which one would see the emerging sciatic nerve block. So what does that mean in terms of an actual scan? So this is what one would be by a continuity of the bone, which is all of the ilium and you'd see the musculature there. As I play the video, the movement of the probe is inferomedially. And if you concentrate on this area here, there is a break in the continuity of that uh, bony structure and that represents the greater sciatic notch. And as the, the scan moves down, one would quite easily see a hyperechoic sciatic nerve emerging from the greater sciatic foramen. Now, if I freeze that picture, one would easily make out that if I have to do an in-plane needling, that would be my trajectory of the needle and I would inject local anesthetic once I uh, get to close to the area and always using dual uh, guidance technique for doing these blocks and also use Doppler in the data because they want to be aware of what blood vessels that you're encountering along the way. The other uh, other method is uh, popularized by Taha. This, the, the anatomy is, the, the surface anatomy is a little different. They, they recommend taking about eight centimeter lateral to the highest point of the natal cleft uh, and find the same uh, ultrasound picture where you can see the ala of the ischium and then if you can't do that, they recommend going up the uh, up the uh, uh, gluteal region and then come down and then find the same sonar anatomy picture where they find a break in the continuity of the bone. So if I go back to the same anatomy picture where uh, if I place the probe here, I'm going to see the gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, then the bony structure. And as the probe moves down, there's going to be a little break in the continuity of that bone. And that represents the greater sciatic uh, foramen through which the sciatic nerve is going to be seen emerging out. So the, the sonar anatomy picture almost uh, is pretty much similar. So that's the bony continuation, which gives a little break, which represents the greater sciatic notch. And one can see the sciatic nerve that is emerging through the greater sciatic notch. Uh, the sonar anatomy picture pretty much is similar to both in both the techniques. And that's the sciatic nerve uh, emerging there. And if I have to do an in-plane needling, that would be my uh, direction and trajectory of the uh, uh, needle. Anterior approach. Now, I have to confess, I'm not uh, a big fan of the anterior approach, and I don't do that as much as uh, I would do the other approaches. But for the sake of completion of the discussion, I'll, I'll go through it anyway. So this, this anterior approach is done for patients who cannot be turned on to one side. 
So it is an advanced and a fairly deep and steep needle trajectory. Uh, does not probably reliably block the posterior femur or cutaneous nerve and for surgeries at the knee and below. So uh, that again is my scan, that's my femur and I've done it. Uh, <clears throat> so you want to keep a curvilinear probe about six to seven centimeters below the inguinal crease with your uh, thigh slightly externally rotated. And you want to see this picture where you see the femur, the femoral vessels, and your hyperechoic sciatic nerve, which is sitting just below your adductor magnus and maybe the biceps femoris, depending on what level you scan the uh, sciatic nerve. Uh, so that's the sciatic nerve. Now, uh, this video is courtesy Dr. Amjad Manyar again, and uh, quite beautifully demonstration of the anterior approach to the sciatic nerve. So one can make out, so that's the femur here. These are the femoral vessels and one can make out the needle trajectory actually is so steep that you can make out the movement of the tissues rather than actually seeing the needle and you're trying to you know aim at this white hyperechoic structure which represents the sciatic nerve and once the injection is done you'll probably realize how the the epimysium of both the muscles separate out and the uh, local anesthetic tracks circumferentially around the nerves so i'll just fast track this and you can make out how well the injection is done make sure that the uh, local anesthetic tracks around the entire uh, nerve and the nerve is surrounded by the local anesthetic. Uh, coming to further down the, the back of the thigh is uh, the, uh, the uh, popliteal nerve block. Now, I think that's probably uh, much easier in terms of the recognizing the sono anatomy and performing the block as well. So, I think placing the probe at the popliteal crease, identifying the structures, which is the popliteal vessels, and then scanning up the popliteal uh, fossa to, towards the apex is what one needs to do for a dynamic scan. Now, I think there has been a lot of debate in literature about where exactly would be the point of injection of uh, the local anesthetic, especially uh, to get a good, fast, uh, reliable uh, nerve block, which would affect both the uh, common peroneal nerve and the tibial nerve. So now position in for a, a, a popliteal nerve block can be actually multiple. You can do it in prone. Uh, you can do it with the head uh, of uh, lower limb held like that. One can do it if you have help uh, with the uh, pro position and the knee position like that. And one can also do it actually supine with a, a figure of four of the leg and try and do it through the uh, as shown. Now, Again, one would want to do a dynamic scan. So starting from the popliteal crease, you want to identify the popliteal vessels, so popliteal artery, popliteal vein, and one would expect to find a nerve looking like structure, which is seen as a bright white hypoetric structure between the hamstring muscles. Now I'm doing a dynamic scan just to make out uh, and identify the, <clears throat> the structures in that area. And one can make out the small uh, common peroneal nerve that goes laterally. Uh, as I scan down the my popliteal fossa and then back up down to make sure that it joins back to form a single uh, sciatic nerve at that area. Uh, again, the, the injection point, I, I think at this point of time, we agree that it's just at the level of the bifurcation when the uh, nerve is enclosed within one single sheet, but at the same time, uh, you are able to identify the two uh, common peroneal and the tibial nerve separately. And I'll come to that later. Again, a special thanks to Dr. Amjad for this video because I think the video is brilliant and it shows how uh, a in-plane uh, needling block for a popliteal nerve uh, block where <clears throat> once the injection is done, you can actually make out the uh, common peroneal nerve and the tibial nerve in its separate uh, entity and the local anesthetic is nicely surrounding the nerve. So Dr. Amjad, thank you again for that. So that's a brilliant uh, demonstration of that local anesthetic around the uh, popliteal nerve, just as it bifurcates into these two entities. Uh, I'm going to go come to a little uh, few of these publications by uh, uh, Dr. Man Manoj Karmakar and his group. And that is going to give us a little insight and which has helped us immensely understand the uh, the structures and the subgluteal space 
uh, which they have uh, described quite beautifully in their uh, publications. So they, they used a three-dimensional and a four-dimensional scanning system to identify a lot of structures, which I'm going to go through. So this is, uh, again, this is a scan, which I think we have gone through uh, uh, through the slides previously. So the greater trochanter, the ischial tuberosity, the gluteus maximus, uh, quadratus femoris, and the sciatic nerve that is sandwiched between the two. Now they talk about this in subgluteal space, which is between the two epimysium of both the muscles. So this is at the level of the greater trochanter and the ischial tuberosity. This is another a different uh, scan where this is called as a niche view where the three planes of the uh, scan are visible. And again, they talk about this uh, subgluteal space, which lies between the epimysium of uh, both the muscles uh, and uh, contains the sciatic nerve. Uh, this is what they talk about is a cranial extension of the uh, subgluteal space as well. Uh, coming down to the mid thigh, again, they're talking about a potential space which is surrounding the sciatic nerve with the mid thigh level. So this is the biceps femoris, the adductor magnus, and there is a sort of a perineural potential space that lies between the epimysium of both the muscles. Uh, that is again, another niche view of the uh, tibial nerve and the common peroneal nerve and the a space that is uh, present between uh, these nerves to cause a peri perineural or a sub epimysial space, uh, which is also seen in this view. So this, they also talk about that this subgluteal space actually extends cranially as an intermuscular tunnel through which the sciatic nerve uh, pa uh, passes from the pelvis to the thigh. So this is in almost in the thigh and the gluteal area. This is a this is a bit lower down uh, in the mid thigh area where the sciatic nerve also is uh, surrounded by a potential space between the biceps femoris and the adductor magnus. Now, why am I talking about all this? So what, what it basically means is that it confirms the presence of a perineural space that surrounds the sciatic nerve. This extends from the gluteal region to the thigh as a continuous intermuscular tunnel. Now, the size of this perineal space they talk about in relation to the sciatic nerve is narrower in the proximal part as compared to distally. And this presence of a perineural space surrounding the sciatic nerve may have clinical applications during a sciatic nerve block. And this may be the facial uh, compartment that you know previous uh, techniques have been showed about loss of resistance during a sciatic nerve block. It might also prove as a conduit for the spread of local anesthetic uh, when you're doing a sciatic nerve block. And also because this is a potential perineural space, it is useful site for catheter placement when you want to do a continuous sciatic nerve block. Now, this is again in 2003 by the same group, by Dr. Manas Kramak and all. And I think they, uh, they have re renamed the uh, the uh, structures that surround the, actually the nerve because before that they were a bit confusing in terms of epineural, perineural and paraneural. So just the gist of this is basically what they talk about in this uh, in this picture which shows that the, the common peroneal nerve and the tibial nerve have a covering themselves which is an external epineurium which forms. So if you compare it to your legs and trousers is what they, they as the analogy is. So the epineurium here externally is the skin of one, one of the uh, of the leg, which is covering of one nerve. The epineural, which is external epineural, is covering of the other nerve. Then there is a paraneural uh, uh, cover, which represents the trousers. And below the uh, paraneurium is a potential space, which is the subparaneural compartment. There is also a potential space between the epimysium of the muscle and the paraneural uh, uh, layer, which is the sub-epimysial layer as well. So I think now from whatever studies we know, I think it's fairly, fairly come to a conclusion that the local anesthetic injections in the sub-paraneural compartment probably gives you the best results. So that's probably what I'm going to always repeat it. The same thing that the paraneural sheath and the facial components, which is the sub-epimysial paraneural compart uh, compartment and the sub paraneural compartment that surround the sciatic nerve and they act as conduits for local anesthetic spread. And evidence so far suggests that it is desirable to perform a sub paraneural compartment injection block. So going back, so this sort of light green covering is the paraneural sheet. Sub paraneural is basically in this area here, which acts as a conduit uh, for the uh, local anesthetic injections. Sorry, this is a busy slide, but this is more recent in 2000, uh, 2021, again by Dr. Manoj Karmakar. But I'm going to go through this as a, this is a further 
uh, of what they said to us in 2013. So a subparaneural popliteal sciatic nerve block is frequently performed as a single injection at the point of divergence of the uh, tibial nerve and the common peroneal nerve. That we know that. So we, we, there has been a debate where it is going to be a bot site as well. So they say that the resultant blockade is faster, longer in duration, are also less likely to fail as compared to when the injection is made uh, sub-epimycetes, which is basically between the epimycem of the muscle and the paraneural sheath. They also say that the ability of this technique to reliably do it within 30 minutes is still unpredictable. And um, our, so their review of this sono anatomy and observations made during this sub-paraneural popliteal uh, uh, sciatic nerve block say that the tibial nerve and the common peroneal nerve within the sciatic nerve trunk are also separated by a sheet, which is they call as a Compton Cruvelier septum. And they are again encased by their own paraneural sheet. So what basically they're trying to say that there may be a, a septum which extends from the bifurcation as well as up to mid thigh level. So that might affect the block dynamics as well. But I think whether to give a single injection uh, in the subparaneural space or to separately give it between the two nerves is still under contention as far as I, I know. Now, volumes of the drugs. Now, I think uh, like any uh, uh, nerve blocks, we are going down on the volumes. I'm just going to quickly touch on this study, which says that they found that 10 ml of 0.5% bupivacaine or opivacaine below that uh, common sheet produces comparable and onset duration of sensory and motor as compared to as, as large as uh, 30 ml as well. But that's probably uh, one's own uh, debatable question. Now I'm going to come to actually the tricks and tips of uh, getting a good scan. I mean, everybody has their own way of doing it. So the, the sciatic nerve, as we all of know, has an anisotropy. So now you see it, now you don't is, is, the, is the property of that nerve. So small adjustment of the transducer in terms of pressure, alignment, rotation, uh, helps us uh, identify the, the nerve. So again, this is my uh, popliteal nerve at sort of the mid thigh level. And I, when I've kept the probe, actually, you cannot make out any neural structure in that scan, but a little bit of pressure, a little bit of tilting play of angles and you, the, sci the sciatic nerve starts to come into picture in that area there. So a little movement, pressure, rotation, tilting of this of the uh, ultrasound probe will will help in identification of the sciatic nerve uh, in this in any area actually you can you can uh, do those play of angles the other thing that uh, one can also do is use of the the pulse wave doppler which is present on most most of your machines so if you if you pulp, uh, press the uh, pulse wave doppler you'll get this line this small structure is called as a uh, sample gate now, if you pin that sample gate on your sciatic nerve, which is in a transfer scan, and just keep it pinned uh, on that uh, sciatic nerve and try and slightly rotate your uh, ultrasound probe to get the uh, sciatic nerve or any nerve for that matter in an uh, from a transverse to a longitudinal scan. And that helps identification of the sciatic nerve as well. So that might be another help in identifying the sciatic nerve. We can't really make out in terms of his facial planes and uh, that's a bright white hyperechoic uh, sciatic nerve that is seen uh, between the musculature as well. And you can actually also see the epimycem of the muscle, which has a potential space just above the sciatic nerve. Uh, when we do an interscaling block, we always say that you want to scan from the supraclavicular area and sweep up the uh, in your neck to find identify the structures in the neck. I don't see any reason. I, I do it many times. If I can't identify the sciatic nerve, then there is no harm going up to the popliteal area, identify the popliteal vessels, identify these two structures that are coming together to form the popliteal uh, nerve, and then scan up. So one can also see in the scan how the uh, sciatic nerve changes uh, shape. So from a round to oval to triangular to almost completely flat as I uh, scan my thigh, which comes almost just below the uh, gluteal fold. So it's almost sort of oval flat shaped in this area here as well. So that's, if you come to know about what the shape of that sciatic nerve is going to be along the thigh, then that also helps in identification of the sciatic nerve. The other thing that one can do is gain. That's another tip you can probably, sorry, you can probably uh, reduce the gain, make it dark 
and you'll realize that the sciatic nerve actually stays nice and hyperechoic and it's much easier to identify the sciatic nerve in that area. You can also see the potential space just between the two epimysiums uh, of both the muscles. So that probably might help. Now, another uh, uh, point which I want to make here is just in case you cannot get the sciatic nerve at the uh, parasacral or the subgluteal region, but you can identify it at the uh, below the inf uh, gluteal fold. And then that's probably get your knee, someone to hold the lower limb like that and just come up to the infra uh, gluteal fold. And the sciatic nerve is going to be sitting just there as a flat, uh, area, a flat hyperechoic structure. And you can use those tips to find the uh, sciatic nerve in that region. Another uh, publication, which a very good friend of mine, Dr. Madan Narayan, and I find it quite useful. It's for the parasacral areas as well. So supposing you find the parasacral areas a little difficult to scan and difficult to uh, needle, then what they mention is the bony landmarks that use are similar to when what one would use for a, a parasacral parallel shift by Dr. Ben Stark. So what they say is <clears throat> this needle trajectory stays away from the neurovascular structures, so increases the safety, and they call this a parasacral ischial plane block. Okay, so basically they identify the same uh, structures as would want to do a parasacral parallel shift. So that's the the ischium, that's the sacrum, that's the greater sciatic foramen through which the sciatic nerve is emerging below the uh, the piriformis muscle. That's the gluteus maximus muscle. But what they're saying is to go. Uh, in plane needling and hit the ischial bone here and inject local anesthetic below the piriformis. So the local anesthetic is sort of going to track down into the greater sciatic morum and, and surround the sciatic nerve. There is no need to use a dual technique or go anywhere further near the gluteal vessels or you know rectum and just inject local anesthetic just above the ischial bone there. So I think that's quite clearly useful. I've done it a few times. And if it is a difficult scan, I think just identifying the ischium and putting some local anesthetic in that area has helped me get a good successful uh, sacral plexus block. Again, just going through the learning curve, ergonomics is something one cannot uh, ignore at all. Dual modality, I would always, always recommend. Now, I think most of us have gone through the, the process where we are using a nerve stimulator and sometimes don't get a motor response in spite of the patient complaining of you know pain during maybe while doing the procedure. Maybe it's a 3D orientation that we still need to get used to. Sciatic nerve is also a mixed nerve. So you might be stimulating, I'm not sure, you might be stimulating only the sensory component and you're not start stimulating the motor component. That's why you're getting not getting the motor response, but the patient complains of pain. Hydro dissection goes a long way in identifying not only the tip of the needle, but also areas at the end of it. I think these are all essentials which almost all of us must do. WHO surgical checklist, monitoring, anxiolysis, post op round documentation and audit. Anisotropy, playoff angles, movement of tissue, hydro dissection, facial giveaways and pops, always give local anesthetic in small aliquots. And also coming close to the end is, can't stress more on the anatomy and sono anatomy. You have to identify normal to be identify abnormal. So I think keep doing the scans in order to get your head around the sono anatomy picture. Bony landmarks and vessels are our guides. Artifacts also, you always need to care for. Pre-procedure scan, dynamic scan, and use of color Doppler also help a lot in terms of identification of structures and avoiding uh, any mishaps. And I think always true is sonar anatomy of volunteers is far better than actual patients. So I think that's the end. Thank you so much, uh, Eora, Fujifilm, Sonocyte, all the volunteers, and again, Dr. Amjad and uh, Dr. Ritesh. Thank you. Thank you, Harshal. That was uh, quite the excellent talk on uh, the sciatic nerve. Uh, you are a wonderful volunteer. Your sciatic nerve <laughs> is absolutely superficial, and uh, I think I could block it with my one eye closed. And I'll call you for the block. <laughs> yeah. So uh, watch out when I'm in Mumbai. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Amit. That too was an uh, excellent talk on, uh, once again, a topic that is close to my heart too, uh, use of the ultrasound for the neuraxis. Uh, we'll take a few questions that have come into the chat box. And uh, I think this first question came uh, during Amit's talk, but I'll actually divert it to Harshal. Can we give a sacral erector spinae block to get sacral plexus involvement? I think the erector spinae block per se 
to get to a paravertebral or a, or any other areas is a little difficult for me at the moment to fathom in terms of evidence i know there's been lot of uh, papers that have come out in favor of the erector spinal block but how actually does it uh, translate into a effective block in terms of doing a regional anesthetic techniques i'm not sure again coming to this question i'm actually not very sure about whether the uh, uh, erector spinae at the sacral level is actually going to reach up to the the sacral plexus i think dr ritesh has uh, uh, has a publication in that if i'm not uh, uh, mistaken uh, we uh, we uh, uh, give a sacral erector spinae block only for perianal surgery uh, but uh, uh, blocked of the sacral plexus obviously we have not uh, Uh, thought about it neither we have given only it is limited uh, our experience is limited only to peri anal surgery and the results are quite uh, promising so regarding sacral plexus i can't comment on that i'm not sure whether amit has anything to add no i i i have not been doing much of sacral esp uh, my logic is uh, the the necessity of truncal blocks uh, is when we have challenges with finding the anatomy of direct nerves so when it comes to upper play, upper limb and lower limb my first choice is uh, up front going and blocking those nerves which i can see very well but when it comes to laparotomy upper truncal and lower truncal where it is very difficult to identify then i tend to depend on uh these uh, interfacial plane blocks interfacial plane blocks cannot be exactly you know the behavior is cannot be comparable with that of an epidural or uh, uh, you know paravertebral where we can have exact uh, dermatomal thing it is more of a vague block and it causes dent on vascore along with multimodal analgesia so if we have a straight forward nerve down there which we can see why not to block it and do a site specific procedure specific anesthesia analgesia you can play with concentration and all that doing an esp uh, probably uh, yes uh, if nothing is there then it can be something is better than nothing but it may not be my first choice it can be a rescue block when suddenly epidural has come out or something i would like to use it amit those are uh, legendary comments by you uh, it makes a lot of common sense if you have the nerve that is supplying a certain area and you can see it why do an indirect technique i think that holds good for uh, you know other techniques like say a paravertebral if you can see the paravertebral space and you have the skill to get your needle in there why do an indirect uh, approach over there and uh, yes the esp be a fall back when there is a lot of difficulty and other issues uh, but that statement made a lot of sense thank you for that but the, the uh, sacral uh, esp affecting the sacral plexus is there any publication on that i'm not not uh, think so so basically uh, we are experiences with uh, perianal surgery okay what uh, we have gone uh, even in the literature the sacral esp is mainly for uh, area surgery around the around the, yeah yeah there is no there is no uh, publication uh, regarding in for lower limb surgery there is no publication in that harshal there's a question uh, yeah. moving on can we block the posterior cutaneous nerve the thigh with a subgluteal block so i think evidence shows that it is not consistently and reliably blocked at the subgluteal level because there is there is one argument that it is not in the same sheath uh, as the sciatic nerve in that area so i would say consistently blocking the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve uh, uh, is probably at the parasacral level and that would probably give you a sure shot involvement of the uh, posterior femoral cutaneous nerve but at the subgluteal level maybe not it's not something that you are consistently blocking now uh, i am not sure of any publications which give you a exact scanning technique of finding the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve at the subgluteal level the one which i mentioned was a cadaveric study where they found it in fact laterally lateral to the sciatic nerve so but to specifically scan at the subgluteal level at the post, for the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve it's something i probably not do at the subgluteal level if i need to catch it i would probably do it at the parasacral level what has been your 
success uh, in terms of attaining surgical anesthesia with uh, higher up approaches like the subgluteal or the sacral plexus. We know, I think a lot of us uh, make do with the popliteal. We are quite competent and going under the uh, paraneural sheath and, you know, getting a dense block. But when it comes up to more proximal approaches like the subgluteal, uh, access into the sheath sometimes can be challenging. Uh, visualization, as you have shown, can be quite challenging. Do you wind up getting a very strong block, a dense block to do, say, an orthopedic surgery on the lower limb when you go and, uh, you know, do a subgluteal? Do you have any uh, good things to say about that approach or do you have any bad things to say about it too? So I'll, I'll sort of divide it into two. So we have got a case series of about 17 to 18 high-risk uh, hip surgical patients where we did those hip surgical. So it may be a PFN or a uh, or an intertrochanteric fracture or even a hemiarthroplasty. I think maybe a couple of total hip replacements as well under a lumbosacral plexus block only where they did not get anything else. And that experience obviously for that area was excellent. There have been instances where lower down the hip where I've done a subgluteal block and maybe I you know not got that much of a, a, a nerve block, which I would have hoped in spite of getting a good uh, spread in that area as well. So then I started to realize that if I were to get a good picture of the parasacral area, then I would probably do that block instead of a subgluteal one. If the surgery is much below where it doesn't warrant me to go that high in the sciatic nerve area, and if it is made to on a popliteal nerve block, then there is no brainer where I would just do a simple popliteal nerve block, which is much easier. But subgluteal is something which is, I would do very specifically if there is something needed now, but otherwise a parasacral or a popliteal is probably what I would go for. If you're asking me at this stage of time, initially before this parasacral and all uh, publications came through and the understanding of the anatomy came through, we were doing the subluteal more. But as you said, the success rate of that varied a little bit. But the success, I think, has gone up with the parasacral approaches, either one of them. And I find that probably much better as compared to a subluteal approach. Okay. Yeah, uh, Ahmed. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, uh, two questions for you. Uh, yeah. You talked. You talked about uh, when you are doing a transverse scan Correct. about about the visualization of the posterior complex and the anterior complex. Yeah. Uh, uh, in in my what uh, uh, we we do regularly are all uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. in the spinals we do a scan, but maximum time you see only the anterior complex. You stress upon about the visualization of both anterior and posterior, but maximum time out of 100, I think 70, you will see only the anterior complex. So, is it yeah. mandatory to visualize both the complex? No, no. Uh, as I was mentioning that article, and uh, it is now a, uh, it is now a very well uh, statement. Uh, now, so. So what is the conclusion is if you can see anterior or posterior complex, it means spinal or epidural is very easy. If you see either spinal, uh, either posterior complex or anterior complex, it is still easy. You can go ahead with that. But if you do not see any of them, then it may be because of some artifact or because of some problem where we are not able to visualize the sonar anatomy uh, clearly, then the author has mentioned that you should keep low threshold for conversion to general anesthesia. And therefore, sometimes uh, uh, somebody will say, oh, this back is very good. We can do it easily. And we just do a pre-procedural scanning and we can, you know, uh, we we will uh, grade that that it is a difficult spinal. We can't see anything, and uh, uh, we then try with parasagittal oblique if we could see posterior complex at some place, and that is how we do it. And that is how uh, it has benefited our patients because then after one or two good attempts, we do not keep on trying and patient and surgeon are already aware beforehand, before first prick, that it is difficult because of the sonar anatomy features. So we can record it. What has happened actually with uh, ultrasound, more use of ultrasound is 
we are actually pushed to alpha s1 area more frequently because of the anatomy the alpha s1 area uh, we can see anterior and posterior complex very well so if we are planning to uh, pick up the best space we most of the time end up going into alpha s1 because it is very nicely seen now this area is good if we are planning for a surgery in the perianal area but it may not be sufficient to achieve you know good uh, uh, good anesthesia for a c section patient so then therefore uh, we have to outweigh risk benefit and we have to see uh, otherwise the sono anatomy will automatically push you in the best space as alpha s1 because it is bigger and where we can see all this so these are some of the areas which we have not done any research but we are looking at it when it comes to thoracic area what we have found is posterior complex is most often uh, it may be an overlapping lamina and somebody may pick it up as posterior complex so in that case with parasagittal oblique scan if we could see anterior complex also then uh, we we feel much more confident and success rate in those patients have increased uh, versus uh, only posterior complex so posterior complex now slowly we have started doing you know direct uh, you know real time and we could feel that it is not the posterior complex it is a bony thing which we are falsely picking up as posterior complex in thoracic area so there are some challenges there are maneuvers being described that if you could lift the ipsilateral arm and turn it upside then it will open up that area some of these tricks we do try uh, but yes if ultrasound is telling me that there is no posterior complex no anterior complex i am taken aback i am i am just saying that we will try it once or twice but not to an extent that one hour patient is in misery and lot of pain i'll inform the surgeon and then i'll go ahead uh, one more thing uh, uh, I, i was uh, it was really nice uh, the study which you are doing have you found any difference uh, in the marking when you are doing a para sagittal oblique scan and you mark the midline and you are just tilting the probe transversely and you are marking the midline have you found that is that line is almost same or there is a difference in the level so this is an intelligent question and that is how uh, you know when we have looked at the literature who is called as an expert in doing spine sono anatomy so different studies have taken it as a different end point so say somebody has done 50 scan before can be considered as an expert so what we have found is uh, when it comes to transverse midline scan it becomes very easy but when it comes to para sagittal oblique and if patient is little heavy built or if they are not able to flex properly not able to sit properly the probe does not lie correctly in the para sagittal oblique area it tends to you know either move inside uh, on the lower end or inside in the upper end and you get a picture somewhere midway between uh, uh, the process of uh, uh, it is not exactly parasagittal oblique not so what we have do, doing is uh, that herschel's technique so you can you know you can put a pulse wave doppler marker in that area to pick up where exactly is the posterior complex and then you go for the parasagittal oblique scan usually you can easily correlate with that and that helps us in keeping uh, you know one standpoint where we can identify it so this is a good idea where you can help uh, even ai facilities uh, i was talking to ultrasound people now they have come up with ai artificial intelligence when you put a probe immediately it will pick up the posterior complex and tell you the depth so uh, also another point is when you insinuate the probe in the transverse midline scan you tend to apply a little bit more pressure and you can actually compress the skin and subcutaneous tissue to 1 to 3 cm that may not be the exact force in parasagittal oblique scan so it can cause some amount of difference with that so there are patient variation as uh, one becomes more skillful you can uh, get this technical hitches Uh, yeah uh, i have just one comment to make uh, yeah. and this study we are hoping to publish may not is asking the patients where their midline is you know they will be surprised that we got a few patients who were you know obese uh, on the heavier side they are pregnant patients and we asked them to locate what they thought was their midline they pointed it out on their back made us did a point on that and then checked it with the ultrasound so it correlated almost all the time where we where, where we thought the operator thought the midline was different patient pointed out the midline was different and that correlated well with with the ultrasound that the patient pointing out the midline versus the uh, 
ultrasound picture as compared to what the operator thought the midline was before he actually used the ultrasound. So that was another interesting finding. So what? Uh, yeah, thank you. Ritesh has something to add. He was adding. Uh, yeah, one uh, one more one more uh, question for you. Yeah. No, one yeah. more question for you. Yeah. You scanning a transverse scan with the patient sitting. Okay. Yeah. You you put your uh, what the app? You I don't remember that app. The yeah, clinometer bubble app for picking yeah. up angle. Yeah. So when the patient is in sitting position, you have only one angle. Right now, what about the when the patient is lateral? Yeah, actually, the clinometer bubble any, app. Any, yeah, if, any tips and tricks for that? that? Uh, the clinometer bubble app is uh, mainly used by all those carpenters and those architects and all that. So actually, it will tell you not only the cephalar cordar but also the lateral angle. So it will tell you all four lines. And uh, what we have found is. Uh, uh, I am not sure this was from the case report from RAPM and we have started using it. But most of the time when we tell that you will get a 10 degree and we try to help our uh, person. But uh, what we have done when without app, the, 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 the limited view method was the app was not used. And in extended view, we have done using all these apps. So what we have found that there was no statistical difference and both groups were comparable. So even if you look at where the probe is placed, whether it is little cordar tilt or cephalar tilt, that is more or less enough uh, than exactly calculating the angle. We thought that probably exactly calculating the angle will add our success rate. It will reduce our needle redirections and all that. But in our study, at least we haven't found that way. Of course, our study was with ASA 1 and 2 non-pregnant patient and with limited BMI. Whether it can be extrapolated to all the patients with scoliosis and um, other uh, challenging internal rotation and other that, I am not aware. I, I cannot be so sure about it. But at least in our study, we found that uh, uh, it has not caused much of difference. Uh, you can use it. It will tell you uh, some idea. Well, what I can, I can tell you from my experience is if once your scanning is done, don't spend too much of time for starting of procedure start immediately so that most of the things are static in position and you you have a visual impression of the probe and you immediately start giving local and uh, try to use it thank you they shared me one uh, photograph of uh, you know ultrasound um, echogenic needle amjit i would like to know your experience on this as well i haven't uh, used yeah I, I i think i have it somewhere right here Yep, it's right here with me in my desk. So uh, I picked this up in Pune, strangely, many years ago. And uh, it's a 25 gauge, 90 millimeter sprotty needle with the echogenic markings at the tip. Now, well, it, the primary problem, you know, uh, Amit, is that getting the alignment of the needle and the beam as well as your neuraxial target in line. So your primary, I'm not a big fan of echogenic needles, but this exists. So your primary, I think, challenge is not the echogenicity, but getting those angles right to enter into the neuraxis. Uh, I have, I bought two needles. I used one. The other one is still here. We haven't used it. So again, it's uh, it's just a tool that is there, but I I don't know too many people who use real time uh, access into the neuro access in their practice. You're probably one of the very few people who do it uh, for the practicality. But I think this might suit your practice if you do uh, you know get access to this needle. You can see if it actually makes a difference. Yeah, with needling, what uh, you can also. Uh, uh, agree with me that when it comes to transverse midline scan or parasagittal oblique scan, we tend to make the probe little oblique. So in a transverse midline scan, it is either cephalar directed little bit or when it comes to parasagittal oblique, it is oblique. So when to get an in-plane needle into that is even challenging. So when we moved out, moved to this out of plane technique, we are a little bit okay with our success rate because initially we thought that no, 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 no. We let us do ultrasound assisted. Real time is only for research purpose and let's not do it. But uh, probably these things and change of technique has helped us. Your in the paramedian sagittal, uh, oh. in the end, when you want to, when you want to access the neuraxis, your needle trajectory 
is pretty much going to be that of a paramedian access. But the difference with the ultrasound is because our probes are so large, you're actually accessing it probably from one space farther yeah, below. Yeah. And uh, that poses the whole challenge. You're, you're looking for the needle and uh, that's where... Yeah. It, Even it is painful. You, we have to give a lot of local for implant needling, which again, we have stopped uh, doing that. And you know, To offset this, uh, Sonocyte yeah. had brought out a much smaller probe, a much smaller curved footprint probe for neuraxial access. Uh, I had seen this many years ago. Do you have any experience using it, Amit? I have I have seen that it is uh, available with one of our institute in Pune, and even the company executive showed me. Actually, it fits in very nicely into that uh, you know uh, that curve of spinal cord, and it is mainly meant for that. And you get a very good image. I have used it in workshops, and I found it really useful. But uh, most of the time, it is uh, uh, it is still not available with my institute, so I am not using it. So I don't have first-hand experience of using it. But it's useful, I am I'm sure. Okay. Amit, can I ask you? Do, uh, and it's open actually. Do you think a two-operator technique is helps better in uh, identifying the epidural? Because ultimately, the finding of the epidural space is by loss of resistance. So instead of juggling the so many things, do you think one person to hold a probe and another person to loss of resistance? I, I think uh, once you involve another person, it may be challenging uh, very well because most of the time the challenges are more when you have two persons unless you are really well set as uh, with your practice. Getting one additional helping hand, uh, I have found that it has increased my challenges. Uh, what I have uh, understood is if you watch videos of different uh, uh, regional anesthetists with a lot of dexterity, they will use, uh, you know, there are chapters in regional anesthesia when you are a single operator, how to perform a block and a catheter, how to use your fingers. Those uh, I've seen Amjad as well, uh, where he has been doing uh, all this. And I think... Uh, we should develop a technique to do it independently. Two operator is mentioned in literature, but I have always struggled when it is two operator. So I would like to recommend that you develop a skill set, try with phantoms uh, to how to hold a probe and how to do it. And you will, I'm sure you will get uh, the technique out of it. Amjad, Amjad is doing uh, quite a bit uh, with catheter single handedly. How you manage Amjad? Uh, mainly because I killed all the people who were holding the probe for me before. So I ran out of people to hold the probe. So uh, that's something that I've been doing for many years, Amit. Uh, it just requires you to train your fingers. Uh, many times we require a second person when you put a catheter because we tend to force catheters. But I always say that a catheter should actually just glide in through the needle into the space. If you are in the right space, you will find that you don't require a lot of force to place it. Uh, so once you get these concepts right, once you learn how to stabilize the probe on your own, and you realize that what you're thinking, what you're trying to image, you cannot always vocally transmit that to your uh, partner around. So then you find this deep desire to actually do everything on your own. It's not too difficult. The needle, once it is inside the particular area, you can stabilize it with just two fingers. You only need two fingers to push the catheter in through the uh, needle. So it's not difficult. Most of the uh, people who have worked with me have learned this technique. And uh, in fact, I encourage them to learn it. I'm sure uh, once the desire is there, uh, anybody can learn how to place a catheter with just two hands and 10 fingers. Yeah, I agree completely. I think uh, be, uh, uh, you will initially in first first uh, 
try uh, it was always when we tend to follow the established literature and they will talk about two hand technique and all that so getting in plane the image will move the needle will move and there is very very challenging next time you probably you may not do it so it's it's uh, sort of a with little discouragement when you have two operators single handedly you develop your own technique i think uh, in long run you are happy about it and as you practice more you develop that sort of confidence to finish it in less time uh and handle the small challenges so, thank think, you uh, it's time to wrap up it's 8:30 now uh thank you amit thank you harshal for a wonderful talk thank you amjad as always my partner in crime thank you very much <laughs> thank you ritesh thank you we thoroughly Excellent. enjoyed ritesh thank, thank you so much yeah. thank you Absolutely. thank you for the film sonosite thank you academy of regional and asia our association thank you and asia tv thank you rahul thank you to all the delegates who logged in and who were part of our webinar see you all next month till then bye bye take care wish you all a very happy deepavali in advance bye bye take care be safe good night thank you good night everybody happy diwali